So last week after service, um, Meridian Schools didn't have school on Monday. So Jamie and I um, surprised our kids by taking them to a water park. So it was, it was a great time. Like, it was this great, like, fun experience. Like, we just told them we're going on a road trip. You never, you know, and to have that reaction, like, we know that there's only so many years left of at 11 and 13 where you get to have those reactions, right? And, like, so it was just kind of this entire fun thing. And so we had lots of conversations and, and kind of back and forth. So at one point, I asked my kids this question. I said, so who would you say is dad's best friends? Like their top five best friends. Just like, I know it's complete middle school kind of thing to do, right? But that's where they are. So I was just like, I was intrigued. Um, I won't list them for you or have them on a slide because I don't want to make anybody feel good or bad or whatever, right? Like, but it was just interesting because Jamie and I sat there and they listed it and Jamie just looked and stared at him like, really? Really? Like you didn't mention me? Like as they're, and I was like, well, yeah, I mean, you're given, you're like my number one, right? But like we went through there and I, and I just thought it was interesting because as they, as they said that and I asked a few like, well, why that person? Just curious. And it's like, well, because you guys coach together, you do this. And it's like, and it's just interesting through their eyes to understand what friendship looks like. And as we go through Acts, the entire thing that is interesting to me is there's a continual part in there where Paul is talking about people and friends that have come alongside of him. So I really just took that theme, and that's why we sang Bruno Mars to begin with, talking about friends, um, because it really is an important thing. And, and so I spent some time kind of going through friends, and I, it's been through my head, and we've had other people. So, so if, you do want, if your kids are middle school age or whatever age, and you want to ask an interesting question, please feel free to steal that one and ask your kid who mom or dad's top five friends are. It will be a very intriguing thing to hear and, um, and to kind of unpack. So, so I spent some time just thinking through like friends because I thought, well, like they didn't mention so-and-so and I realized they don't really know that person because at that season in my life, I may have had, you know, my, fr my roommate Ben in college, we were super close. We spent all the time together, but my kids have never met him. I think the last time <coughs> he was even up here was for like Jamie and my wedding. So like life transitions, life changes, things are different. And friends are such a unique thing. So I, I searched up what makes a good friend. And the way Google works is you never get the results that you're really looking for anyways. Um, and it came up with what makes a good friends TV show. And I was like, oh, this is interesting. Now I'm in this rabbit hole of like, what makes a good friends TV show. And somebody had the audacity. I love both these shows. But somebody had the audacity to write an entire article about why Brooklyn Nine-Nine is a better show about friends than the actual show Friends is. And so then I had to read more, right? Like clickbait, like I got to understand why, why Brooklyn Nine-Nine, like I didn't understand. And I went into this entire thing and, and it just made me laugh, like the, the, the breakdown. And really, if we're honest, both these TV shows, if you've watched both of them, have parts of like, yes, what a good friend is, but it's also not really like great friendship things. Um, even though one is called friends, right? Like the entire thing about a friend, it, like what makes a good friend is a unique thing. What makes somebody that walks through life together, as we say here at this church, is such a unique thing. What makes somebody, and really what it comes down to is when they walk through something that is so difficult with you. When they walk through something that is so beyond imaginable, right? Like something has happened tragic in your life and they walk through that. Or go back to when you're younger, you know, something maybe happened at school and they stood up for you. Or what, whatever aspect of that, that's what a friendship is about, growing through that. And so being a good friend and trying to be that, and, and a couple kids here have played sports for me. <coughs> and, I, and I harp this at every practice, the first day of practice, and I have three rules as a coach on how to be a good teammate. And, and it's to be a good, you have to, to, be, to be a friend, to be what the rules for me as a coach is, you have to, be, number one, be a good teammate. You have to be the, the person that is looking out for somebody else, the person that is encouraging, the person that's that. The second is to always try your best, and the third in youth sports is always to have fun, right? Like, 
I mean, my fourth one that I never mention is we win at all cost. But that one is, that's just the unwritten rule for anybody that's ever played a sport for me. But right, like, it's that same thing, to be a good teammate, to be a good friend, to walk through that thing. So as we wrap up this book of Acts um, that we've been going through, and going through the final five chapters today, we're, we've come to the spot, and just again to give you a recap, the book of Acts was written by Luke. He's, he's there for a lot of these illustrations. He's being a friend of Paul. He's, he's walking through this, and the entire theme that we started with was it's the beginning of the church. It's the beginning of the early church, and it's growing and growing and growing. And the last half of this has all been about Paul and how Paul has continued to to share the word of God, to, to, to share with other people. And he's gone through so many things so far as people have wanted to kill him. There's been plots to, to have him taken out. There's all this stuff. And he talks about, and he continues to talk about his story and Paul's story of transformation and his growth. So we've gotten to now Acts 23. And Acts 23 starts with Paul is, again, in trouble. He's in front of the high priest, he's in front of all these people and they're, and they're, and they're just, and they say, you know, they're pretty much wanting him dead because he's talking about God and they don't like that for many different reasons. And this first part that we're just going to read is just the beginning of 23. Gazing intently at the high council, Paul began, brothers, I've always lived before God with a clear conscience. We're setting the tone for today. Like Paul is talking about what it means to be a follower of God. And he, and he says, and he looks at them, and as they're accusing him of all these things, he just says, brothers, I've always lived before God with a clear conscience. I've always done my best. I've always been everything that, that, I, could, that I feel like God has called me to be. I've walked through all of this stuff, and I have no apologies for the way that I've lived. Even though you want me dead, even though, you know, all this. And so he says that gazing intently, and it's just kind of funny because right after he says that, the high priest looks at the people and say, slap him in the face. And they turn and they slap Paul in the face to try to get him to shut up. Like, I don't want to hear it from you. And I think it's kind of ironic that as Paul continues on talking, he looks at him and the, and the crowd is mostly made up of two different types of people. You have the Sadducees and the Pharisees. So in a nutshell, without going into deep Bible, all this stuff. You have the Pharisees who are the kind of the traditional Jews, and you have the Sadducees who they believe that there is no like eternal life. There is no nothing after you die. So Paul just kind of plays this like little like, okay, I'm gonna you just slap me in the face. And he and he lays out, I believe in God who died and rose again. And it's like immediately you feel like that comment, and if you read through Acts, you go, okay. Obviously, we know that, but Paul's just kind of jabbing them because now you have these two people, the Pharisees and the Sadducees that hate Paul, and all of a sudden, he put the one thing that says, here's how you two are different, and they start fighting with each other now, and I got to believe in my version of this, Paul's sitting up there just kind of going, yeah, you guys hated me because I believe something different. I just told you what you guys believe are different. And they start fighting, and they start going back and forth. And they get so mad at Paul again, and they put him back in his jail cell, and they get so mad, they go, okay, we're going to make a pack. We're going to come together, and they make this pack. They say, we are not going to eat or drink until we kill Paul. We're done with this guy. We don't want him anymore. We don't like what he's doing. And, so we're no, and they all like agree upon not eating or drinking until this. Well, Paul's nephew gets a hold of this story and finds out. So he goes and tells the high priest and everybody what's going on. And so they surround Paul with a, just an army of soldiers to protect him and say, okay, this is not good. This is not right. And they move Paul. And we go into 24 where he's under Felix who is sitting there and, and he's just kind of caught in this entire thing of like, I don't see what you did wrong, but all these people want you dead. So I don't know what to do. And Paul's just saying, I'm a Roman. I need to go to Caesar. And he continues on. He goes from Felix, and he moves on to others. And, he, and all, these, all these people that are in charge of Paul, he has this conversation. And Paul keeps saying, I'm not guilty of anything other than serving my God. I'm not guilty. I've done nothing wrong other than tell people about God. You have, like, I, almost it's like, why is everybody mad at me? I've done nothing wrong. And it continues on. And then they talk about the Roman law, 
that they can't convict a Roman without a trial, and they continue on. And at the end of 25, Paul has this interesting comment where he just kind of lets everybody know, like, you, you, you realize I, nobody has anything on me. I have the power to be set free, but, but I want to go to Rome. And he starts talking more and more, and he, and he always has this idea of wanting to go to Rome. And he, and he keeps sharing this, like, and so they finally say, okay, we're going to send you to Rome. We're going to send you, and, you know, Caesar, and we're going we're gonna to get you out of here. So they put him on a boat, and, and I feel like what's going on here is, is Paul has this moment where he's starting to see his entire moment was to go to Rome. And we're going to talk about the importance of that shortly. But in, as we move into 27, we get on a boat. And I want you to understand, this boat was not like the Carnival Cruise Line boats, right? Like, this was a boat with 230 people on it, and they were packed tight. A lot of them were prisoners. A lot of them were, were just people that were, you know, traveling and carrying these guys. And they have this conversation back and forth. And this guy, Julius, is in charge of, of Paul, and he kind of befriends him. And he, <coughs> and he walks through this entire moment with Paul. And Paul, like, warns him and says, hey, don't go this way, go this way. And they don't go the way that he said. And a big storm comes, and Paul just kind of has this moment, which I think is ironic in many different ways, because at this point, if you've studied this, you went through this, Paul's already survived three shipwrecks. Like, I feel like that's like, if I'm on a plane with a guy that has, like, survived three plane crashes, I'm not feeling, like, all that good about, like, Something's wrong with this guy. Why does he keep being on these shipwrecks? And Paul just sits there and goes, hey, I've survived. Like, we've done this, but I need to tell you that God has a bigger story for us. And this ship is going to be destroyed. And all the belongings on the ship are going to be destroyed. But none of you will be destroyed. I feel like that's like one of those like, uh, uh, okay, like how, what? And so they continue, they go through, and, it's, and they go through three days of not seeing any sun, and the storm continues, and the ship is completely destroyed, and they end up on the island of Malta. And, they, and, and just like Paul said, everybody makes it out. They, they end up on Malta. They have this moment, and they, the, the people on the island welcome Paul and welcome the prisoners, and there's a story of Paul getting bit by a snake, and they all think he's dead because this is one of those deadly snakes. And he lives through that. And he continues on, and after three months on Malta, he finally gets on another ship, and he ends up in Rome. And as he ends up in Rome, he sits there, and he, and he, and he is in prison still, but he's, he's telling them all, because there, he's a Roman, he's, he's allowed, and he starts talking about God, who God is in Rome. And he starts sharing that. And I want you to understand, I, I couldn't think of any analogy as I talk about Paul being in Rome. But you have to understand, at that time, Rome was the center of the world, right? Rome was everything. It was the empire that ran everything. And Paul's entire story got him to the moment where he finally ended up in literally the center of the world, right? Like, I was thinking New York City, but New York's really not that for the world. Like, this is Paul's entire journey has brought him through this. And so as we go through this Acts, like, there's so much to unpack here but his, Paul's entire story and why it's so powerful and why I really want us to hit home with this today is to understand that God timed all of those moments out. God worked through all of those things of people wanting to kill him, of shipwrecks, of all of this stuff. God worked this all out so Paul could be in Rome. And what happens in Rome at the very end of Acts, the very last two verses of Acts, is right here in Acts 28, 30, and 31. For the next two years, Paul lived in Rome as, at his own expense. He welcomed all who visited, boldly proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ. And no one tried to stop him. So it says in here that, that Paul literally started his day in Rome from sunrise, talking about God, to sunset. People would come and were so hungry to hear the word of God. So all of those trials that Paul went through, all of those things that we talk about, I'm sure didn't make sense to Paul, but this was God's timing and working through Paul to literally share the gospel with other people. It was Paul just going, hey, like, 
God, I just, I'm so excited. And he'd went through the trials. He went through people wanting to kill him. And he's now arrived here in the center of, of what the world <coughs> at that time period and shares it. So have you ever thought about like the trials and the things that you go through in life? And you sit there and you go, why? Why, God? Like this, this doesn't make sense. Like why did you make me go through this? Why did you have me walk through this situation? Um, I've, shared, I've shared with a lot of you about my impending surgery coming on Wednesday. And, and this has been a tr- uh, an issue for years and years and years that I've tried to get fixed and tried to, tried to go through. And, and finally, we celebrated back in November when this doctor said, hey, like, this is the surgery. We're going to do it. And it, yes, I, I can't promise it's going to work, but it's an 80% chance it's going to work. And Jamie and I celebrated, and we were so excited about it. And he said, but you got to wait. And I was like, okay, God, like this isn't, okay, we'll wait, we'll wait. And January came, okay, well, now you got to do a CT scan. Well, now you got to do another. Now you got to do this. Now you, and we wait, we wait, we wait. And, and so then finally they called two weeks ago and said, here's your surgery date. It's going to be February 21st. And Jamie and I celebrate. And we're like, that's great. And then this week they call. And they're like, so, yeah, your insurance says no. And, I, and so I sat there and I just, I leaned into it and, J- and Jamie and I talked and we were like, God, why would you take us through all these steps? And this is something minor compared to Paul, right? Like, I'm not even saying like, am I on the same radar as Paul? This is something so minor. I'm like, God, why would you walk me through every one of these steps to then just stop? And I'll admit, Wednesday was, you know, depressing, like, okay, this isn't going to work. And the doctor, they call again Thursday. No, it's not going to work. We tried this. No, it's not going to work. And Jamie and I just said, we're going to trust you, God. We're going to walk through this. And God, whatever it looks like, we're going to walk through. And we were in the car. It was 7 o'clock Friday night. And I thought, okay. And Jamie and I are talking. Like, she's like, yeah, I guess I won't. I won't. I'll tell them never mind about my sub. I'll never mind about this. And we start making contingency plans because we're like, it's just not going to work. And my phone rings and it's the doctor's office at seven o'clock on a Friday night. Okay, what's this about? And the doctor personally called us and said, hey, and we got to jump through some more hoops, but he's like, hey, you know what? I appreciate the fact that you were willing to do this. We're going to make this work. I'll see you Wednesday. Let's do this. And like, like we look through that and, it, and right, like that's such a minor trial that we went through in our week. But yet, being faithful and saying, God, you have orchestrated all of this, reminds me of Paul. You've orchestrated all these aspects of my life. You've walked through those small things and those big things. And I don't understand it. I don't know why. But God, you love me enough to walk through that with me. So I'm going to trust you that you have this situation under control. It is one of the hardest prayers and things to say as a Christian. To say, God, I give up all my control. I give my worldly, what I think I can maneuver and whatever, I give that to you, God, because I don't have control. But I trust that you know what is best for me. Do I know that this surgery is going to work? No. But I trust that God is going to orchestrate and walk through that life. Do I know Every maneuver I do, every step of faith we take, no, I don't. But I trust you, God. And Paul, in the book of Acts, is the reminder of that over and over. Paul's story is about putting people into his life to encourage him. Like, right? Here again, this entire book of Acts is written by Luke. Luke is not mentioned since the beginning of this book. He talks about Paul. All of these shipwrecks, all of these things, Luke was with him and had a firsthand seat to go, wow, God, look at what you're doing in Paul's life. These people want to kill him, and he's willing to just say, God, I trust. He's in the middle of a boat that is falling apart, literally falling apart in the stormiest of all storms. And Paul's saying, we're good. God promised me he's going to take care of us. Luke had a front row seat 
to watch his friend change the world by going to Rome. And that's what friendship's about, is encouraging each other, growing each other's faith. Luke was there for it. Paul's friends that walked through that, 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 that encouraged him. Paul experienced the, st- the stoning, the prisons, all of that stuff, and Luke was right there for him. The importance of that. So as I take away the, my two big points that I take away from today and is, is that right there. The first part being that Luke was willing and, and friends were willing to walk through that. Paul became great because he leaned into God, but I truly believe that God put friends in his life to encourage him. He used each other. He used our friendships to grow, to walk through those times when we have somebody that passes away, when we have a bad doctor diagnosis, when we have whatever is going on, when we have a car that's broken down. He's using each other to encourage and to say, you know what? God has you through this. He's using that friendship. And he's also using you by your time growing and and spending time into that. So we've went through the book of Acts, and, and there's been parts of it that if you've read and followed along, you're probably still a little confused. And, and I think the Bible is such an amazing thing because the more I read it, the, I get something completely different out of it. I took classes in college about the New Testament. I took classes about Paul. I took classes about this. And even going through it this, this time with you guys, I got different things out of it because I'm in a different season of life. I encourage you to get into the Word to read your Bible, to find, to find that. So, so we went through Acts together. Um, the next series we're going to do is we talked about is the pitfalls, and we're going to talk about a bunch of stuff, and we'll go through all of that, the pitfalls, of, and, and kind of do a little bit of explaining that. And, um, and we're just going to talk about marriage and, and worldly things that, caught, that catch us. And we're going to go through that. But, but I encourage you on your own, to, to as we go through this next series, and if you're looking to dive into your word, as we finished up Acts, go to the very next book. The book of Romans is a great book. It, it takes the story of Paul in his time in Rome, hence Romans, right? Like, it, it, takes, that, it, it takes his excitement, and you, you get a version of Paul as an older man. I'm in my 40s now. I feel like I'm an older man. Yeah, I'm pretty old. Um, as I'm limping, no, but right, like, like you get Paul in the, the season. The things that we look at when we were 20 and go, hey, that was smart, and we now at 40 go, that wasn't smart. I'm going to go play basketball for eight hours and be fine the next day. I, I can't look at a basketball. I can't watch basketball for eight hours without being sore. We, we grow. We become wiser. And, and the book of Romans is that right there. The book of Romans is, is Paul just sharing those stories of being so excited about God and giving the knowledge and giving the excitement of what life looks like. I encourage you to get in the word. I found this, I found this quote this week, and it, and it was really kind of neat. Um, it was from Toby Mack, his, his Speak Life quotes that always pop up. And it's, it's not how much scripture you know, it's how much scripture you live. I know many people that know the Bible frontwards and backwards, and they don't live it out. But when you, when you read something and you dive into something in the Bible, and you, and you put it into your life and you grow into your life, that's when God can truly move in you. So my encouragement, if nothing else out of today you got out, or if nothing else out of the entire book of Acts over the last six weeks hasn't hit home to you that I would hope that this one sentence will. Every season should build trust for the next season. The season that God has you in right now should build trust so that you lean into God more in the next season. Wherever you are in your faith, whether you're, you're sitting here today going, I know nothing about the word of God or I've studied it for 82 years. I don't think we have anybody that old here. If, if we do, I apologize. Right, W-82? W I swear we just celebrated your 11th birthday. That's so weird. Um, but right, like we, 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 no matter what season of life you're in, no, mo- no matter what that is, 
being with God this season should build trust so you can lean into God next season. You can be stronger. You can walk through that. You can grow. Because the more that we are conformed to God's image, the better follower of Christ we are, the better human we are, the better example we're setting for people to see Christ in us. And that's my hope for you. Pray with me, won't you? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much. Thank you so much for being a God that loves and cares for us. Thank you for walking through those trials, those seasons that Paul talked about, like, of, of are so much more than anything we will ever face. But yet the seasons that we're in sometimes feel so difficult, and we don't see a way out. But God, you promised to walk through that season with us so that we will lean more into you in the next season. I pray that you will be with us as we go this week. Be with us. Encourage us to encourage others. Encourage us to be a good friend. Encourage us to show people Christ. Encourage us to be the friend that people need, not what we want to give. God, continue to bless and watch over us and guide our steps so that we will not take a step without you. Thank you so much as we celebrate life's wonderful things and we also come alongside during life's tragedies as we, as a church, look to grow together so that you will be seen in this community. It's in your strong and powerful name we pray. Amen.